I'm Stephen Riley. Again, I'm director of the Speed Art Museum, and I this is a bittersweet evening. Um, there's great happiness and a little bit of sadness associated with tonight's Adele and Leonard Light lecture. Great happiness because this is one of my favorite events that we do across the year. The Light Lecture was endowed and created by Adele and Leonard Light's children, Jonathan, Jenna, and Peter, who out of um, respect and love for their parents, created a lecture series that has brought many of the world's greatest art glass artists to the speed to talk about their art. Um, and it's especially appropriate because Adele and Leonard um, loved artists as much as they loved art. They commissioned many works for their collection and they really grew, grew close over the years and felt a very personal attachment to the artists who were in their collection. It's a little bit sad tonight, um, in fact, also because this is the first light lecture to be given without either Adele or Leonard um, with us on earth. Shay Rhodes gave a lecture a few months ago um, which actually came at a very poignant moment when Leonard was in the hospital um, at a visit that he didn't come back from, um, but he had visited the exhibit. And so I just wanna use this opportunity um, because it is also my last light lecture to introduce as director of the Speed Art Museum to share my love for Leonard and Adele. I'm so glad that their children created this ongoing gift. I'm so glad that they created this lecture series um, while Adele and Leonard were with us for many years to enjoy these artists coming in and to see the way that their children honored their commitment to the speed and to our community. And I'm so glad that I got to know them for so many years. As I've told some of you, um, I joined the board of the speed myself in the 1990s and Adele or Leonard in, in rotation were always on the board while I was there. They were always among the most devoted, passionate about art, opinionated about the museum, educated, informed, delightful, sometimes irascible, affectionate, um, and always committed to artists, to the speed, and to the permanent, the importance of our permanent collection. Um, I love the title that we've given this exhibit, co-curated by Scott Urbis and Norwood Viviano, collecting a love story, because it it clarifies and reminds us of Adele and Leonard's love for each other over their 68 year marriage. Their love for the speed reflected in their gift of over 400 works of art collected by them during their marriage. And of course, our love for them. Um, I loved Adele and Leonard and I loved their love for artists and their love for our community. And I wanna just um, give a toast to them um, and a little bit of a goodbye to this series personally in which um, at the next light lecture, I'll be joining you all as a visitor and just say how grateful I am to have been part of this long, long flow of generosity from Adele, Leonard and their children and many others who make our permanent collection what it is. So thank you. And with that, I'll introduce Scott Urbis, our curator of decorative arts and design and the curator who really inspired Leonard and Adele, helped their collection and their collecting become more ambitious and stood by them through 20 plus years of their lives in Louisville. Scott, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I would say Leonard and Adele inspired me and museum staff more than anything. And I agree, tonight is bittersweet, but certainly the spirit of Leonard and Adele live on in this series. As Stephen said, it was one of their great joys to get to know artists um, who came in for this lecture series. And I, in fact, was looking at some of the details of the collection and noticed that among their early acquisitions directly from an artist was a piece from Dale Chihuly in 1979, when Jail, Dale Chihuly was still a fairly young artist at that point. Um, I think it's very appropriate tonight that Beth Lippman is our speaker. Leonard and Adele were passionate about her work, acquiring an early example in 2000. And then in 2009, her, Beth's very ambitious, remarkable work, Laid Table with Watermelon, Acorns, and Chalice, which is featured in the exhibition that Stephen mentioned, Collecting a Love Story. So I, I hope those of you that have the chance to see the exhibition will come. Um, it's gonna be open through the summer and, and into part of the fall too. So plenty of time to see it. Um, I think the, the measure of how much Leonard Nadell uh, loved Beth's work is that the large laid table had some of the best real estate in the house. It was right inside the front door, which uh, spoke to Leonard Nadell's uh, love for the work and the importance they saw in it within their collection. 
<laughs> I'll say for museum staff, that location just inside the front door always created a little bit of terror uh, when we were taking visitors through the house or, or we ourselves were working in the house. Um, but on to Beth. Uh, Beth is a 1994 graduate of the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Um, and I've really been drawn to her work. And I think we'll, we'll get a sense of this tonight uh, with the, the resonance of history that she takes from the past and brings into the very present. Um, her work has come to be represented in many, many private and public collections um, around the world. Um, and I have to say, I've been most impressed uh, working with Beth on the conservation of, of one of her pieces, the one that's in the exhibition, but also that during the COVID era, she not only created a site-specific commission for the Crystal Bridges Museum, but remotely installed a solo exhibition um, at the Museum of Art and Design that I'm hoping to see once I'm back on the road. Um, an exhibition that I understand, Beth, will be open uh, into the fall as well. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Beth. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I wanna to thank the Speed Art Museum and the Light family. And of course, um, I owe a tremendous debt uh, to Leonard and Adele for, for having um, faith in my practice really from the beginning. So um, it, it really means a lot to me to be here and to, to share this evening with you for a couple of minutes. Um, <clears throat> I just wanna start by saying I'm sitting on the grounds of the traditional lands of the Potawatomi, Chippewa, Ottawa, Winnebago, and Menominee people. And I pay my respect for elders, both past and present. Um, Karen, I think we can go on to our next image. I'm actually in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. Um, if you're wondering where that is, it's it's the center of the universe right there, just north of Chicago. And um, I've been here since 2005. I worked um, for over a decade in arts administration, as well as having a studio practice. And I moved here to, to oversee the arts industry program of the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. And I've been here ever since. Okay, next. So my studio practice um, primarily happens here in this space where I'm sitting tonight. And it's in this space, I have a lot of um, research that takes place. It's primarily conceptual practice, but I also make components, I prototype. I mostly work alone, but um, I occasionally work with others as well, which uh, as some of you might know who follow artists that work in glass is really a necessity. And, and for many of us, a true pleasure to come together and connect with others. Um, my studio is 10 paces uh, from my house. So I have a very long commute as you can imagine. And I have a small hot shop where I fabricate a lot of the components that are under uh, like a linear 12 foot, 12, uh, 12 inches rather. Um, I also do a lot of kiln work in that practice. I also, once again, um, am constructing things in this space as well. So um, let's go to the next slide. So when necessary, I work and also sometimes when it's desired, I do work with other industry as well as um, visiting other residencies and things like that. So you'll see here Pilchuck, the Museum of Glass. I've also worked at the Corning Museum of Glass, uh, Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center, as well as um, a lot of private studios, Urban Glass as well. Um, I really enjoy that, but I'm also working with industry. I work in metal as well as ceramic photography, video. So I find myself in different circumstances working with uh, different kinds of processes. Okay. Yeah, so once again, 
uh, I came here in 2005 because I started working for the John Michael Kohler Art Center. And the residency program um, was one that I actually attended in 2003. Arts industry takes place at Kohler Company and um, it's fully funded by Kohler Company, but it's administrated by the Arts Center. So it's a true marriage. And um, when I came back to oversee that residency in 2005, uh, I found that it was really a fantastic, this area is a, kind of a fantastic place for introspection. It's very easy to live here. There's also a, a, a very vibrant cultural scene while small, it's still quite interesting and, and really unique to this area. So um, that's, that's been really quite rewarding to stay here over this period of time and kind of invest in the community and also get a lot out of this community. Okay. Just gonna delve right into uh, my practice. This is actually not my work <laughs> on, on screen at the moment, but my practice explores aspects of the human condition, um, material, culture, and time through still lives, immersive installations and photographs. and you'll see the Felix Gonzalez Torres and the Peter Klez on your screen there. Both of these works, one extremely contemporary and one not so much, uh, investigate the, the idea of time, the elasticity of time, time as it relates to humans and prehistoric time as well. So time is really, uh, it centers my practice and my investigation. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the, the very beginning of my practice um, outside of, of graduating from Tyler School of Art um, revolved around me kind of really focusing on the still life tradition and not necessarily because I was fully aware at that time <laughs> of all of the things that, that would really drive my practice. But I was given the opportunity in 2000 to create a response work to anything in the permanent collection of the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And I chose Still Life with Fruit by Severin Rosen and decided to investigate a three-dimensional version of that particular painting. And I was not, I'm just gonna share this with those of you who are creatives in the audience. I, I really did not know in the immediate moment why I just did that, but I just kind of followed my intuition and then began to understand some of the things that were driving me within that practice afterwards. And I just wanted to point that out because in hindsight, it seems very kind of obvious. You can talk about things, verbalize things, but it actually sometimes takes years to really understand what is driving you. And um, at times you may only understand 10 or 15% of what drives you. But in the beginning of this practice, the still life, genre, I was really concerned with thinking about the time that still lives came into the, the foreground. Um, the still life tradition is interesting to me because it was the first time in, um, in history at that point when uh, inanimate objects were really uh, portrayed front and center as the primary subject matter in paintings. And it was the first time in history that food uh, was actually produced in surplus that people didn't have to separately scrounge for anything to eat, that it wasn't hand to mouth anymore, that it became a commodity. And um, still like with fruit after Severn Rose in my work was really part of what was driving that was this like kind of late capitalist stage that we were in in the late 90s where um, it was just felt, I was living in New York City at the time um, on, a, on a shoestring budget, and there was a lot of excess around me from, from my perspective. 
And so I, I was really thinking about the parallels between the economic moment that we were living in and the time, the Dutch golden era. And this has become really central to my practice, just posing different points in history with our era to try to understand why we're here doing what we're doing and why things are kind of unfolding in the way they are. Um, so that is a thread that carries through my work. Okay, we can go on. I just wanted to talk briefly about the piece that the lights actually purchased from my first solo exhibition in New York, which um, happened, I think, within the year after creating that very first solo light. Flowers and Fruit after honoring Emery Boubre was in that exhibition. I might have been actually in a group exhibition now that I think of it, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it was to have created something and understand that it resonated with the larger public in some way. And that, you know, really as an emerging artist. And the lights really, you know, I'm sure that they were fully aware of that, but it was a tr it was true testimony. Um, looks like, am I having a lag time or something? Do you want me to turn off my video? We'll do that if, if you can, then you can just see the work, okay? Anyway, for the first five years or so, I really, um, I, I really cleave to representation of specific paintings so that I was almost trying to insert myself into the history by creating an homage to that particular painting and that particular artist. So I, I really spent a long time um, kind of getting into the granular details of specific paintings that I chose for symbolic uh, reasons. Next image. This, this is a, a glamour shot of, of the piece that was Scott mentioned that is now in, in your collection in the exhibition a table with watermelons, acorn, and chalice. And um, this, this was a piece that was created uh, almost a decade into the series. And at this point, I really departed from um, specific references to very specific paintings. And I had really absorbed the vocabulary of the still life genre and began to kind of use it and harness it in a way that was truly like taking ownership over it in, in my opinion. Okay, next one. I think of these still lives, and the great thing about still life is that there's so much room for interpretation in still life. Um, you know, that first impetus was really about this ec the economic prosperity in both uh, points in time and history. But as I practice, the, the focal points within the genre really um, were, they were a little bit more divergent for me. Like I, <clears throat> I started thinking about all of these objects as surrogates for individuals or portraits of societies or institutions or and individuals. This, this is called One and Others. And it is actually a work from the Norton Museum of Art or it's for, it was made for the Norton Museum of Art is in their collection. And it's a composite portrait of uh, aspects of their permanent collection and an early settler who is actually buried underneath the museum, um, a man named Richard Hone, who was a victim of homicide and was a pineapple grower. And then also myself, the, the it, image is a little bit hard to see, but the entire table is actually a casket that is made to my dimension. So the, the top of the table kind of overflows with uh, interpretations of scientific illustrations of pineapple plants and then aspects of the Nort Museum collection. Okay, we'll go on. This is sideboard with blue china. Um, many times 
the work refers to a domesticated space and a domesticated interior. I also anchor most of the work with some kind of furniture. I am really fascinated with the anthropomorphic nature of furniture. And I really uh, like this kind of allegorical body that happens when a piece of furniture, which is also a piece of sculpture, uh, becomes body at the same time. So a sideboard with blue china, while you can't see it in this particular image because it's <coughs> a little far away, it actually incorporates um, human organs in the altar. So there's male and female genitalia, a human brain, <coughs> lung, a heart, <coughs> excuse me, kind of cellular structures, veins, hands, feet. And I've combined these depictions of the human body with objects and, um, and animals that are a part of human predation. This is really a contemplation on kind of the fragility of the body and the corporal body. Also, some of you might know the history of the sideboard, which is a very performative piece of furniture where there's very ceremonial things that happen, like the carving of the turkey. Even though the sideboard itself is not particularly overly functional. Okay, we're going on. <coughs> I hope I don't cough my way through the whole <laughs> presentation, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna talk to you about some of the response works that I create. So I have these two um, kind of main um, paths in my practice. And one is my studio practice where I'm investigating all of these different things that I've been talking to you about. And then the other portion is really uh, ways of responding to primarily institutions, um, histories of institutions, histories of individuals, and how they relate to institutions. And um, I made a, a work for the Moses Myers House of the Chrysler Museum of Art. It's called Adeline's Portal. I just want to point out on the right of your screen, there is a sampler above the mantel place, and that is Adeline's only, um, the only object of Adeline, who was the eldest daughter and caretaker, the house manager of the Myers family, who lived uh, at the home throughout her entire life. And there is no um, drawing or painting that, that we can ascertain what she might have looked like uh, from. So this, this sampler is, is the closest mark of anything that is left behind by Adeline. Let's go into the next slide. So when you walk into this space, you're actually in her bedroom and um, you're invited to open what looks like uh, to most people to be a bookshelf, an enclosed bookshelf or some kind of closet space. And when you open the door, you find this kind of liminal, there's two doors, it's almost a liminal space. It's actually a space that was created with the best intentions by a contractor in the 60s who thought that they were returning the home to its uh, original footprint. And in so doing, created this like no man's land space, essentially between two other spaces. And you can walk up to this, this closeted area and there's a three foot raw drop straight down to another level of the house. And it ends with a window at the very back. So in addition to kind of exploring the specific history of Adeline and Moses Myers and his family in particular, I was also very interested in the kind of belief system that are developed around things that we consider precious, that we hold on to, that define our identity. 
And so all of the objects within this room are referencing other objects that are considered heirloom or part of the Myers um, history. And some of them are authentically from the Myers family and other objects were gifted to the museum because the community felt strongly that it belonged in this house museum. I'm really very interested in this idea of shifting and evolving belief systems. It's another thread that runs through the work that deals with, you know, kind of the elasticity of time. All right, let's go on. Another response work that I've created. Um, this is called One Portrait of One Man. It's for the Weissman Art Museum. And it is actually um, an homage to Marston Hartley and Gertrude Stein. And it, it actually encapsulates his painting, One Portrait of One Woman, which is a portrait of Gertrude Stein in symbols. So you'll see it above the chest of drawers. And once again, I just wanna call attention to that piece of furniture as an allegorical body. So within that body, you will find um, remade artifacts that belong specifically to Marston Hartley in his lifetime, as well as Gertrude Stein. But there's really very few entry points, visual entry points into this chest of drawers. There's one at the pelvic region and there's one at the heart region and everything else is kind of there, but also removed. Blanking the painting and the chest of drawers is a drawing that refers to um, the World War I trench warfare. Um, Harsby, um, Marston Hartley was an outstanding American modernist, but his life was deeply impacted by both wars and kind of died shortly um, after the, the Second World War, or, or right before it, I'm sorry, one, one, like 43 or 47. But anyway, the first one completely, as, as it did most people who lived through it, um, you know, rearranged his life into a 180 degree other direction. So every aspect of this piece is really uh, like referring to his journey and in turn also referring to Gertrude Stein through the painting and the object within. I would also like you to know that Stein wrote a word portrait of Hartley as well. So this is kind of a meeting of all of those individuals, including myself. Okay, let's go on. Lately, I have been investigating prehistory and deep time. So um, in 2013, I did a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship at the Museum of Natural History in DC. And I wanted to find a vocabulary that I could talk about climate change, um, which was actually not really being talked about that much uh, <laughs> eight years ago. Um, and and I, was, I was desperate to start to incorporate the language some kind of language that would bring people to thinking about this existential threat of our species and all species. So in a, in a very kind of roundabout way, I realized after my research that I had to harness the vocabulary of what we kind of intuitively think of as prehistoric. Um, and so I started to incorporate ancient flora into my work. This is called In Earth. And on the top of the table, you'll find um, mosses, lichen, ferns. Um, there is a cycad tree, which is also considered ancient. It starts as an architectonic column underneath the table and then pierces through the table and sheds over the landscape on the top of the work. And all of the cultural objects are kind of abandoned and remain underneath. Um, this is at the Museum of Wisconsin Art. You can see 
a really remarkable painting in the background uh, called The Flagellant by Carl von Marx. Um, so anyway, I am still very much involved in thinking about where we're at as a species in this larger kind of geological timeline at, that, at this point. So <clears throat> while the symbols of the cultural objects that we surround ourselves with are still rather specific, they also are very general in that they are about us just as a species. The, the age of the Anthropocene, which is the age that we're living through. Okay, let's move on. Um, additionally, I've done, I've explored photography that is dealing with some of the same issues. So in this case, I've taken objects, handmade objects out into the wilderness and kind of inserted these cultural objects into um, in some cases, pure wilderness, in this case, both of these are in Alaska. In some cases, there are some marks of the human. So detritus, uh, chalice with detritus on the left, you'll see there's actually a garbage dump behind that chalice. And these photographs are sized to the actual objects that are um, featured within, within the photograph. So the chalice on the left is about four foot high and the piece itself is about 30 inches wide by 50 inches tall. Okay. Um, working in a very small way with metal, once again, um, taking uh, this time miniature cultural objects, domestic objects, architectural details and kind of building dioramas within Amazon boxes actually, combining that with paleo flora and then um, using molten metal to simultaneously destroy and finish the diorama. So it burns away um, all of the positive and then what remains is almost a fossil of that moment. We can go to the next slide and you'll see what I'm talking about. So these are quite small. Uh, the largest one, ironically, is on the left. Most of them are not that large, but that's only 11 inches tall by 17 inches wide. So taking the same vocabulary and, and really exploring it in a more miniaturized form. These are cast iron. The one on the right is also chrome. And as the chrome uh, processes, it does not like to travel within, so the interior space is actually rusted as well. Okay, we're moving on. Just want to share some recent projects that I've done. Um, recently, I had an exhibition, Every Last Thing, at Nora Jaime Gallery in New York. <coughs> Once again, kind of investigating some of the same concerns in different ways. Um, on the right, you'll see Northern Monkshood composition. Northern Monkshood is actually an endangered species that is also uh, quite lethal to humans. So it, it puts roots down under the table and then kind of grows up from the table. Okay, next slide. This is called Scale and Gazing Ball. I started this uh, work right before the pandemic and I. I do feel like it is very much about the pandemic in many ways. So there's these kind of biomorphic forms that are really uh, protruding and growing across and impacting the symbolic objects that are within the, with, on the table. Okay, next slide. This is an overall image of that gallery um, exhibition. All in all is in the center. Once again, we've got like paleo landscape uh, that is crawling over the surface of that table, which is about, a, I think it's about an eight foot long or 10 foot long table, somewhat lower table, like almost a coffee table height. And underneath is encrusted uh, vessels, uh, domestic vessels that are all turned upside down and are kind of encrusted on the undercarriage of all in all. 
next image. I also want to point out, thanks Scott for also giving a shout out to the Museum of Arts and Design that Collective Elegy, um, which is a, a selected works from the last 10 years is on view at the Museum of Arts and Design. And I did in fact install that over five weeks with Zoom. So now I feel like I can do anything basically. <laughs> I don't know if they feel that way, but it was, it was challenging, but um, I could not be on site because of the pandemic. And um, I've had a chance to visit it since then. And I can say that they did the most amazing job without me on site. Uh, next, so next few images are of Collective Elegy in case you can't make it there. It's also available online to, to see virtually. Phenophylum and Chains, once again, using the table as uh, almost a timetable where there's things encrusted underneath and then ancient flora spilling over cultural objects on the top of that white table that you see, and some of the distill works that we just talked about and the photographs, okay? Laid timetable with cycads on the top. Once again, another investigation that's negotiating deep time and using the, um, the table itself as literally a timetable and some uh, kind of pointed pieces of furniture called margin for error on the bottom. It's a crib that's sinking into the ground and then a shaker adult cradle for rocking the morbid faces the viewer as they walk past the crib. Also some photographs and a whatnot in the corner. Next. <coughs> this is a, a very, very new uh, project, which will be, I believe, a lifelong project. It's called House Album. And House Album is a selective portrait of the United States <clears throat> that explores issues of agency, identity, and memory. Um, so there's two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. All of the objects represent specific individuals or events in the history of the United States. Next slide. This particular piece was inspired by the Victorian tradition of miniature house scrapbooking. At that point, it was the first time in history that there was a plethora of images, printed images that were available to households. So young women and kids of a certain class um, would would kind of harness these images, cut them out, and create their own version of an ideal home. So I'm taking that tradition and I'm really um, subverting it a little bit and, and really um, imbibing every single aspect of the choice as our allegorical collective home in the United States. It's very subjective, actually. It's also a portrait of myself in the way that these Victorian house uh, miniature house scrapbooking traditions were portraits of the people as well, their identity through their choices. Um, there is a video that is actually available um, on my website if you're interested more about this project. Let's go to the next image. I have a few more about this. So I uh, the next objects that I'll be adding to house album. Um, represent Unga Stacy on the left and James Baldwin on the right. And I will just continue, as you can imagine, <laughs> there are countless individuals and events that I feel belong in my house album. And it's just a matter of finding the right object to add. Next, approaching the near end, I hope we're doing okay on time. Um, another thing that I'm just finishing now is an artist washroom for a brand new building called Art Preserve. The washroom itself is called Wild Matter. Art Preserve, you'll see here on the right, it's actually opening to the public June 26th. Next slide. <coughs> Art Preserve is uh, basically a, an open storage semi-permanent exhibition of the John Michael Kohler Art Center's permanent collection 
which is of primarily environment builders, um, self-taught artists, and um, it's a massive collection and it's fabulous. So the whole focus of our preserve is obviously preservation of these cultural treasures. So uh, when I was thinking about <clears throat> ways of, of negotiating the washroom in this particular building, I thought I would create a bridge to thinking about preservation and conservation in ecology, which brought me to Wild Matter. So in Wild Matter, we can go to the next slide, are over 1,200 images of 1,200 species found in Sheboygan County. And um, when you walk into the vitrine, um, walk into the stalls of the washroom, the vitrines um, behind the toilets actually have slip test clay specimen sheets of species that are extirpated or extinct. So <clears throat> it kind of brings you down this path of, of thinking about preservation of, of the environment as well as uh, cultural treasures. Next. I didn't have uh, finished shots of that because it's still in process. And <clears throat> I think lastly, uh, I just finished a work for Crystal Bridges, as was mentioned previously. It's a part, it was open simultaneously at the same time as Crafting America, which looks to be the most amazing <laughs> survey of craft. Uh, just brilliant. The catalog is great as well. And I created a work that investigated the identity of one woman, and that is Abigail Levy Frank, who was a matriarch in American colonial society. She lived in New Amsterdam, and she was married to a merchant marine and was uh, from a merchant marine family. Um, okay, let's go on to the next image. Um, so I created a traveling trunk that traveling trunk investigates issues of immigration and assimilation and agency. And really, um, it really contains the seeds of uh, very current dialogue and concerns that we are facing and continue to face as citizens of the United States. In this particular case, the traveling trunk is fully closed the only uh, kind of opening at all to this trunk is through the keyhole. So as you know, you must have permission to open this trunk. <laughs> um, but it's pretty much removed uh, from, from any kind of understanding of what's within. So you're just seeing everything through those shadows as well. And I think the next image is just more links to where you can find out more information about some of the things I talked about. Thank you, Beth, um, so much. That was really great. I'm Abby Shu, the Deputy Director of External Relations and Advancement at This Speed, and want to encourage you all to submit your questions for Beth. Um, you can drop those in the chat or you can drop them in the Q&A function, but we'll spend the next few minutes um, and to kick us off, Beth, I wanted to ask you, I know a lot of your work is based in sort of sense of time and wondered how the last year of the pandemic and the time warp that we all lived through has influenced your practice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, um, I do believe that this period of time is going to be reflected on and in and really investigated and impact the rest of, of my lifetime. And, and we're certainly still in it, right? Um, so it's fascinating. I do, you know, I, I <laughs> and perhaps other artists can relate to this, but like my immediate uh, like daily rituals did not actually change that much right i walk out of my back door and i walk into my studio and i make work <laughs> that's basically what i do um i i usually travel a fair amount 
uh, whether it's with installation or doing research uh, to generate new proposals, things like that. And it was fascinating to understand that there could still be connections, you know, through Zoom. Here we are, right? But I, I think that I think that the I was very honed in on like natural cycles of growth and decay, which also crop up in still life often. Um, and I think that they that this kind of like language is going to be recognized in a different way. That's my hunch. Um, is that it, it, it is going to be, uh, it's gonna take on a different kind of meaning after, after this time. Scott, did you wanna chime in with the question? Yeah, well, I'm, I've been interested in your work uh, for a long time, Beth, and in part because of this idea of giving physical form to memory and time. And I'm just curious, what first started you on that path and, and how, did the, how did your language of materials evolve as you started to, to work through this aspect of your practice? Hmm. I mean, initially I have to say the focus from very early on was, was actually about food. <laughs> and um, which was something that was really very, uh, food eating was front and center in my family growing up we were, we were the kind of family that would talk about what we're going to have for dinner the next night while we're having dinner um and so i think the still life i backed into the still life because of the depictions of food within still life that that was the the kind of entry point and my mother was um she was a self-taught artist, essentially. I mean, she took some classes, but she was a, um, <clears throat> she had a product line and did um, kind of Pennsylvania Dutch folk art. Um, and so she had tons and tons of books of still lives and food because it, it you know, it segued with this other decorative art, right? Uh, because I grew up with, in York and Lancaster County. Um, so um, that that is really like where I where I went with that, and I also have a fiber background, and I think that the way that I build things and accumulate things is very much about other ways of working, like this almost a fiber a fiber material studies way of working where you're at, you're adding things. To, to other things to work instead of subtracting. Um, but I, you know, I just, I investigated different materials at an early age and I just, uh, once again, very intuitively just kind of went in directions that were really hard and also kind of provocative. And I, I don't know why I continued to work with hard materials. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it was the challenge of it, you know. Speaking of, um, I just got a question that came through about what materials you're working with on the bathroom project, um, saying that the botanical wall is really beautiful and wondering if that is made from glass. So the tiles for the wall uh, are two thirds slip cast clay and the, the, the images were crowdsourced. Um, so I, I worked with uh, a, con oh, an, a Wisconsin herbarium consortium and um, called the list for Sheboygan County. And then I just like started crowdsourcing all of the images. And then I worked in Kohler's factory in the pottery with a lot of help because it was a massive project and created the slipcast tiles. A third of the tiles are glass. And I created those in my own studio, but then they were um, printed at a place called Skyline Design that is located in Chicago. Um, so it, it's a cold application. So the, the wall itself, the walls 
kind of undulate. The decals are very much on the surface in the clay version of the flora. And then when you hit a glass um, tile, it kind of recesses into the thickness of the glass and comes forward again. And um, the, the images themselves are kind of bleached out further into the stalls that you go. So it's like this, this loss is kind of paralleled with the, with the loss of color. Well, I have one last question. <laughs> so I was just, yeah, I wanted to ask you about color because certainly one of, uh, however you want to put it, to potential seductions of glass, of course, is the aspect of color. And, um, you know, I, you've always worked in colorless and, and now some with, with black. Um, you know, we, we, when you first started thinking through your practice, was color ever part of the conversation you were having with yourself? Or did you know that the absence of color was an important part of what you were trying to achieve? I think because I am so kind of focused on every aspect of the qualities of the material and what they represent, um, <laughs> that I, you know, color to me is very symbolic and expressive. And it can also be decorative, which I love. I, I root a lot of my, my practice in the decorative arts from a conceptual standpoint. But <clears throat> the absence of color, I think, enables the viewer to imagine something beyond what they're seeing. So if you're seeing, and then your eye is, op you know, optically, you're not stopped by color. You can see through. Now, I know you can have transparent color, but you still are processing color differently. And the introduction of color to me would just, I mean, it would be very specific, you know, in terms of a direction. Um, the absence is more about almost like the distillation of an idea. Um, it has room and uh, an expansiveness that allows almost anything to come in and 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 be interpreted or exist in that space. The black is really interesting because I kind of came at it from this like thinking a lot about Victorian culture and mourning culture and this idea of silhouetting as well. But the interesting thing about black too, and the, I mean, the way I love to use it is that it is also very, uh, it's mysterious in the way that clear colorless glass can be mysterious. Like you're not able to see through it, but you're seeing reflections in it. And, and sometimes you can't really even understand the form if it's black on black. And so there's a void that opens. And I'm, I am really interested in that. I'm interested in the unknown, actually. And so the, the absence of color, I think, allows that entry point. Great. Well, thank you so much, Beth. This was um, a really fascinating discussion and we love having your work at this speed and as part of collecting a love story and hope that you will be able to make it to Louisville to see the show in person soon. Um, and thank you all again. Thank you, Beth. Have a great night. Thank you.